Ladies and gentlemen, Kamasi Washington. All right, I've been asked to say before we start this that uh, your shows are completely sold out tonight. So anybody who's listening to this who uh, wants to come, uh, I, would, I wouldn't try it unless high ticket items and things like that. I'll have two tickets outside. Uh, there are some shows uh, for Noise Pop tonight that are not sold out, so go on the website if you want to see Kamasi and couldn't there's some good stuff happening. So there you go. Um, anyway, my name is David Nelson. But the important thing is, is this is Kamasi Washington making a triumphant return to San Francisco. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And um, this interview is kind of my doing, and I just kind of want to, do you mind if I kind of quickly explain why and then jump on in? Is, um, so I have a record label called Birdman Records, and um, I was in Los Angeles uh, 15 years ago when I heard about this band called the Young Jazz Giants playing down um, in, uh, I don't know, southeastern Los Angeles. In, in, in Lamar Park. Yeah, and uh, I don't remember how I found out about it, but I did know that I've been, I was waiting and craving for young people to be doing jazz, and I, I immediately went down there, and I guess it was one of the first shows. Yeah, it was one of our first shows that we did ever. <laughs> and how old were you then? Uh, I was probably 17. Um, and... Uh, and I just saw the show, was amazed by it, and immediately asked them if they wanted to do a record. And we on Birdman Records put out the Young Jazz Giants record after recording it soon after that. So um, you've been all around the world since then, and then some. And uh, you've been talking a lot about uh, where you're from, how you all got started, and things like that. The man of the hour when you and I first, first met was Billy Higgins. <laughs> Uh, he was the guy who, for those of you who don't know him, I was turned on to him because of the Sandy Bull records that he did. I mean, here's a guy who was deeply involved with jazz, but also kind of made this mutation with other styles of music, both rock and roll and, and raga and all this other crazy stuff, and created this blend, this sound that uh, really inspired many. Um, can you talk a little bit about Billy Higgins and, and what he was doing and what he meant to you? Right around when you were a teenager? Yeah, and it was, it was really big for me uh, in particular because uh, it was that kind of Art Blakey, Lee Morgan, Wayne Shorter, that clique of musicians that really got me into jazz. So on most of my favorite Lee Morgan records, a lot of my favorite Wayne Shorter records, it was Billy Higgins. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, on drums. Um, so, you know, when I was about Oh, we're getting you some water there. I'm sorry, I just got off an airplane, so I'm like, you know, in that mode. Everybody here is like, don't <laughs> talk too much. We want you for tonight, you know? <laughs> um, I see it right over. So um, when I was about 13, I started really hanging out in Lamert Park, and um, there was, like, one of my heroes, like, <coughs> just, like, sitting and chilling in this little club called the World Stage. And I, at first I was like, kind of like, can I talk to him? And, <laughs> and I, you know, over, over time, he, he just was really available. And um, <coughs> it really like um, empowered us as young musicians because you just don't know um, You don't know if what you're doing is good when you're a little kid. You know, we were practicing all the time. We loved music, we loved playing music, but it was uh, getting that like nod from someone like Billy Higgins was like, it just like gave us fuel. And was, was the world stage his stage? Was it <clears throat> the one that you were on? He started that club with a guy named Kamal Daoud, and uh, it was his club. And we were, you know, like that, like that, that, that may have been our first gig. If it was, if it was 2000 or, Maybe, well, I guess now nah, we probably played there before then. But he would just come down sometimes and just sit in with us. And he was so humble, he would say like, hey, you guys mind if I sit in? <laughs> and you know, we'd be like, yes, Mr. Higgins, you can sit in as much as you want. And uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, that was, um, it was big for us, for sure. So, um, and I'm gonna take you a little farther now. So we decided to do the record 
And we did it, I don't know if you remember the name of the studio, it was Rotun Rascal down in the valley. Do you have any remembrances of that session? Was that the first time you guys were, I think that was the first time you guys were in the studio as a, as a group doing it. Am I right there? Uh, I mean, we, 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 we had done little stuff. Like, I think we did something for, it was, it was our first time as a group definitely recording. Um, and it was, um, yeah, it was really cool for us because we just, uh, we had all these high, <laughs> high expectations for what we could do in music. So it was like the, the first time we had our, our, our window to the world, you know? It was, it was like, wow, we're really gonna record an album. It was, yeah, it was really cool. It was definitely, I, I, I'm pretty sure we had all recorded other stuff before, but we never had the chance to record our own music. So it was really cool. Um, and you guys, uh, I don't know if it was because of the connection with, you know, that Birdman had with alternative music, but you guys immediately were embraced by that whole faction of Los Angeles. I don't know if anybody here remembers Arthur Magazine, but they had their Arthur Fest and, and you guys played that. What was it like playing with all those crazy bands back in those days? It was fun. I mean, we were, we were like, we were pretty like high energy young kids, you know. Um, we were never home, <laughs> you know. So it was like for us to get out and get to play music, you know, I mean, we, we were just, we were always excited for it. So that was a cool one, that was like, Really cool to like get introduced into another world and like you know especially in that on that tip like the kind of experimental rock and roll like that was cool for us. Yeah. Did um were you in school at that point studying music or was that right beforehand? I I, I believe that we was, we recorded the album right after I graduated from high school. So I was um I think you know I either just started at UCLA or I was on my way to go to UCLA. So, so I have a question about the UCLA thing. So you're somebody who has a deep passion for the music of the world, right? I mean, you know, we were just talking upstairs about how you've been involved with the, some Ethiopian jazz bands and you've definitely played with hip hop bands and rock bands and things like that. You, you've been a deep student of music. And, and yet, I think anybody who listens to your music thinks it really does come from the soul. So there's the head and the, and, and the heart that are going on at the same time. How do you balance those things when you're, when you're making your music? Well, it's almost like the, um, you know, the, the seeds of music come from your heart. And then, you know, your mind is what waters the seeds. Um, so, you know, if you don't take something from your heart, it's like you're just watering the dirt. <laughs> You know, and nothing, or, you know, you, you may get some moss, but that's about it. So um, what I always try to do is, you know, the, the origins of all my music, I try to reach in, into that void or to that space that, you know, it's hard to tell if it's coming from me or from some other place. And when I, you know, I can capture a gem or something like that, then I use my experience to figure out how to shape that and turn that into something that I can share with other people. Because um, a lot of times it's something really simple, like sometimes it'll just be a rhythm, you know, that I get really excited about because I can like <laughs> imagine the possibilities um, or maybe one particular chord, just a group of notes um, or a melody or a bass line or a whole song. I mean, but it's your mind is what allows you to to take those small ideas that you get from that special place and turn it into something that's more tangible. So you've been um, traveling the globe now, playing your music. What is it? What have you been finding out there that's been really turning you on? What's been kind of like bringing you know some rain to your soul right now? Well, it's that. It's like it goes back to when I was at UCLA. I, I, I was an ethnomusicology major, so you know I studied all these different types of music from around the world. And as I've gotten to travel, it's been cool to like actually meet those musicians or like, you know, like, I think when I was in Brazil, I met a, a saxophone player who studied with Hermeto Pasquale and like, when I was at UCLA, I was such a huge Hermeto Pasquale fan. I was like, he didn't speak very good English, but I was trying my best to use my broken Spanish slash Portuguese to get him to let me meet Hermeto, you know? And, uh, you know, so just playing music with different people and um, it's powerful. I mean, like the, 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 the way you get to connect with different cultures and different people through music is a, is a powerful thing, you know. It, 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 it really, in a way, connects you with the world. And you start to realize that 
our individual struggles aren't, aren't so uh, individual. Um, the young jazz giants, the guys who are the young jazz giants, you're still playing with today. I mean, I think one of the amazing things about this movement that you are definitely a part of is the fact that you guys have been playing together now for 15, 16 years, and it's the, uh, it's the West Coast. Um, yeah, the West Coast, I mean, it's been really longer than that. I mean, we've been playing with each other since we were, I mean, like the Bruner brothers and I have been playing with each other for 30 years, like since we were babies. Um, and then everyone else has been about 20 years because it was since we were like, you know, 10, 11, 12. Um, it is, it really is amazing because you think about how far we've gone. Like just seeing David is like, wow, man, that's a trip of the journey of music, you know, because like the people on that record, like, you know, Thundercat was playing bass. He was probably 15 years old. You know, his brother Ronald Bruner was on drums. Terrace Martin, who was one of the main producers of Kendrick Lamar's album. Um, Ryan Porter, who still plays with me. Like we, we've all been through so much. And it always trips me out, like, um, you know, we'll be, you know, somewhere in some small town in Europe and someone will walk up and have the Young Jazz Giants album. And I'm like, man, I don't even have a hard copy of this album. <laughs> like, how did you get it? Like, you know, and they're like, and they're like, man, I've been listening to this album for years and I've always wanted to meet you. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's so amazing, you know, the power of music. I'll make sure you get a copy of it. I, I have a few copies left, you know. They're desired items now, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, I, I, I've read a lot about, you know, the making of this thing called the epic, right? And uh, I, I, you've told the tale of how you came up with the idea of the epic. I was hoping you wouldn't mind retelling here today the epic, what that meant and how that came about. Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, so... For years, I was really making my living playing for other people, you know, and I was, you know, playing for Snoop and Raphael Sadiq, Lauren Hill, you know, Gerald Wilson, a lot of people. So I was a young man and I was making pretty good money. So um, I um, had a little home studio. So I would just do little albums and stuff like that and write music and create stuff kind of really just for myself. And, um, <clears throat> Way, way back a long time ago, before the Young Jazz, actually at the inception of the, world, of the Young Jazz Giants. So the first thing the Young Jazz Giants ever did, which is my first band, we did the John Coltrane competition. It was our first gig, our first thing that we ever did as a band. That's how we got our name, actually. And uh, we won the John Coltrane competition, and uh, Robbie Coltrane gave the award, and he brought his little cousin um, Steven, who was Flying Lotus. And uh, Flying Lotus and Thundercat were the same age, and so they became friends. And so years later, you know, I, you know, I was like, you know, listening to, the, you know, this music that Thundercat had been working on, like Cosmic Grandma and stuff like that. And I was like, oh man, is that the same dude, you know? And then one day, randomly at a jam session, um, I saw Flying Lotus and we just like kind of reconnected. And then maybe a year later, he was like, man, you want to put a record out for Brain Feeder? And uh, I'd already had in my head this idea of, uh, I wanted to do a record that, because I, <clears throat> I had this band of these musicians that I grew up with for years, and um, we always played together. It, the way we play is really free and really open. You know, we improvise a lot. We, 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 you know, there's no set arrangements. There's no, nothing is, nothing is for sure. Nothing is concrete when we play. It's just whatever happens is what happens. But in school, I, I did a lot of writing, and um, I was really into like classical music, I was really into orchestral music, I was really into like large-scale writing, so I wanted to somehow connect those two. And right as I was thinking how to do that, Flying Lotus asked me to make a record for Brain Fear, so I was like, oh, okay. But at that time, all these musicians are super in demand. Like, you know, Thundercat was playing with Suicidal Tendencies and like people like Flying Lotus, he had his own album out. Ronald Bruner was playing with um, Stanley Clark, George Duke. Brandon Coleman was playing with Babyface and Rochelle Farrell. You know, Cameron Graves was playing with Wicked Wisdom. And it was, everyone was everywhere. So it was hard to get everyone together. So the way we did it is that we said we were all gonna make our own albums together. So we, uh, 
We booked the studio out for a whole month and just made music every single day, all day long, like, you know, from 11 in the morning to 2 in the morning. We are just making music. And um, <clears throat> I ended up with this amazing amount of music from my album. And, um, you know, even though I knew I wanted to have a big, large ensemble, I didn't think I was going to end up with that much music. And, uh, you know, it was something in that that is what, you know, really inspired the epic to become the epic. Um, I mean, there's another little story. Like, I, I was trying to figure out what to put on the album, and I, um, I had this crazy dream that went along with that. And um, there was a story that kind of intertwined all the songs. And that is definitely what made me like make up my mind and say, yes, I am putting out all these songs together. But even before that, like, I realized that I had so much music that it wasn't going to be something small. You know? It's funny, the way you record it sounds a lot like the way Sun Ra used to record, except John Gilmore would actually get a record out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you said you pulled stuff out of there. That means there must be a lot more material those other guys have. Is that stuff coming out? Does that come out? What's going it's on? Co it's that? coming out, yeah. We talk about it all the time. I mean, there's some really amazing records, you know. Um, really, really amazing, really like unique, really pretty groundbreaking stuff that we were making in those, in those sessions. Um, that's definitely coming out. We're just trying to figure out the best way to do it, how to, you know, put it out there in the best way. Let's talk about groundbreaking for a minute. I want to talk about jazz for a minute as well. People are listening to the epic and they're talking about this is like the, the next coming of jazz. And I, I guess the question I have for you is a person who kind of takes all different kinds of music into your, your yourself when you're when you're creating. What is jazz these days? I think people who saw Ken, Kendrick Lamar at, at the Grammys might say that he's jazz. The way that he kind of builds a, a structure of the song and the way he kind of dealt deals with it, it's almost Albert Eiler esque in some ways and how crazy it might be. You know, what what is is there a jazz in the twenty first century? What really is jazz now, would you say? Well I think like any other genre <laughs> Jazz is just a word, you know? I mean, music is music. I mean, um, it's kind of what you want it to be, you know? I mean, just like, you know, if you think about like, yeah, like To Pimp a Butterfly is hip hop, and so is Luke, <laughs> you know? So they're, they're related, but they're not that related, you know? And same time, like, you know, like you said, Sunrise Jazz, and at the same time, you know, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's so, it's such a wide span of music. It's, you know, hundreds of years, or over a hundred years old. There's, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of artists, millions of songs that have a connection in that there's a certain level of, of creative freedom that, like, I think that when, when, when it happens under a certain set of circumstances, we tend to call it jazz. Um, I don't think you can really associate any particular um, musical device, meaning like, you know, it used to be if, if you had a drum beat that went ding, 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 that was jazz. But I mean, when you listen to modern jazz, so much of it doesn't have that particular rhythmic figure. The chord changes have changed, the melodic devices have changed, the instrumentations have changed. It's an idea. You know, that, that, that is very much, a, it's a very subjective term. But I think any word that is supposed to encompass a musical style is subjective. You know, I mean, like rock and roll, there's a really, really, really wide span of what that is. You know what I mean? Um, you know, there's a pretty big, you know, gap, you know, between <clears throat> the Beatles and Slipknot, you know? But they both that's probably the first time that's ever been said. I just want you to know right now. Um, what do you do after the epic? You've done the epic, right? Yeah, right? Three album box set. What's, what is next for uh, Kamasi Washington on, on that level? The Homeric epic. No. <laughs> no um, um, you know, I've been, it's kind of funny that, you know, I mean, um, a lot of the music from the epic is actually pretty old for us. I mean, we recorded it in 2011, 
and a lot of it was written way before that. Um, it's kind of funny that like by the time the Epic came out, we really hadn't been playing those songs at all. We had to kind of relearn them. <laughs> um, so there was all this music that we had been kind of playing around the time the Epic came out in 2015. And then there's a lot of music that I've written since then, you know, that I'm really excited to kind of put that out there and let people hear like, you know, what's actually currently going on, you know. Um, so we, we've been talking a lot about, you know, getting back in the studio and just, you know, recording again because um, the music has definitely evolved. So I think people will see another almost kind of, it will feel like a bit of a quantum leap, like, whoa, that's pretty different from what you were doing in 2011. But I think it's really cool. I mean, I think I've, um, I've traveled a lot since then. You know, I've played more, you know, you know, I played my own music more in last year than I probably did in my whole life before that, you know. I had more gigs in 2015 that were like, for me, than I probably did all the gigs I had for myself before that, so. How, how does that change you as a musician, or does it? You know, listening to yourself, listening to your own voice every night. <clears throat> you become more self-aware. Um, you know, hopefully you don't become more self-conscious, but I feel like I've become more self-aware and I kind of have a clearer vision as to where, where I'm kind of going musically right now. I mean, it, it changes, you know, you know, making music, playing music, it's like, um, it's like uh, climbing a mountain in the dark, you know, like you, you kind of know where you're going, but then something happens and it sends you in a different direction. So I know where I'm going right now and I know what I'm doing right now and I know what I kind of want to do. So there's... It's a good time for me to record, actually. Because you know, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you're lost. Sometimes it's like you hit a plateau and you're just like, I don't know what I want to do. Uh, so luckily for right now, I'm at a pretty good time. So I should probably hurry up and record before, <laughs> before it goes it away. Lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, out of all of it, do you still have the, the Billy Higginses? Are there still people you go back and listen to? Are you listening to a lot of music? Or is it just that because you're playing so much, it just, you know... You wake up in the morning like maybe I want a little silence a little bit, you know. No, I'm, I'm a huge music fan, so I'm, <clears throat> you know, most of my money gets spent at Amoeba. <laughs> What's you in know? the bag? <laughs> <laughs> All kind of stuff, man. It's like it's funny, like, you know, I, I just stopped going there, you know, with 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 average musical consumers because I go on Amoeba. It's a two two hour, you know, experience. It's like. You know, I'm not like, go in, grab one, and leave. I'm like, I have to go through each section, and like, it's part of the experience for me. I have to go through the vinyl, I gotta go through the CDs. Then I go looking through the movies, and it's a whole whole thing. So I'm always listening to new, to new music. I'm always looking for something new that um, has inspired me, and, and it's a really good time in music right now. So, um, you know, I used to <clears throat> find myself really looking back, you know, for inspiration, and like right now, I do find myself hearing things and seeing more current events in music that are like inspiring me. So it's. I'm sure there's a couple of people here who would love you to throw some of the little gems that there are the current gems out. So you got any uh, any of the stuff you're listening to the new inspiring people for you? Yeah, um, there's a singer named Laura Mvula from uh, the UK who's really really amazing. Um, there's a guitar player named Zane Carney. He's making some really cool music right now. Um, pianist named uh, um, Chris Bowers. Um, you know, even though I've worked on it, but Kendrick Lamar's record inspires me a lot. Um, Thundercats record. I mean, I'm, it's all over the place. I mean, um, there's people like Teebs and you know, the whole Brain Feeder circle. There's a lot of really cool music coming out of there. Um, you know, and then there's like the Robert Glaspers of the world. <clears throat> it's just everywhere. I mean, I, if, if you're really looking nowadays, you can really, you know, you'll find a lot. Well, I mean, I was wondering, I, how much time do we have? Are we doing all right? Yeah? All right. Um, I wanted to know if there's anybody from the audience who had a question for this man. Anybody at all? Yes. graphic novel to the box set. 
Yeah, it is going along. It's going along. I mean, it's a story that <clears throat> came to me as a dream, and like it, I got pretty good at telling the story. So I've been working on writing it down, which is a little different than telling it. Like I can tell it to you really well, like a, you know. And so um, I'm about halfway through really writing it down. And I'm also still searching for the right visual artist to um, to capture the feel of it, you know, but, but I feel like first I need to really get the story down, you know, like I, I wrote it down, but it was really like, it was written in a way that I'll probably don't, it'd be the only one that would understand it. <laughs> so I'm writing it like for real now. And um, it's, it's been cool. That's been a cool process to do that, you know, to kind of relive it over and over again. Do you, do you dream a lot? I mean, is that, was that just one dream you've had, or is, are you the type of person who dreams just often? Yeah, I'm Aquarius, so I'm, I am a big time, spacey, you know, stare at the wall, you know, fall off into my own little universe, you know, person, yeah. Yeah, do, do, you, um, do you look deep into the interpretation of your dreams, or is it something you just kind of keep with you as you're walking the earth? You know, I don't always try to interpret my dreams. I kind of just enjoy them. <laughs> They're like entertainment for me. But, you know, I can't, they usually if I try to interpret them, I understand what they're about. Um, but it's almost just like, I don't know, it's like, it's fun for me. And even as a kid, like I could just sit and literally just, if I can get a little space to go off into my own world, I could just do that. My parents were like, oh, you're so easy. <laughs> I didn't even need a toy necessarily. You know, I could just kind of float off and be away for a little while. Do you do that when you're on stage? Can you, do you, you hit the moment when you're playing and just kind of like? No, not when I'm on stage because I'm, 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 I'm tuned in to other people. I'm, I'm, it's the reverse. I'm like, I'm really not. I really try to tune in to what's happening. But like, <clears throat> I don't mind long car drives or long rides because that's just like, you know, on the airplane, like, I can definitely just like go off into my own little world for a little while and then come back. Speaking about tuning into other people, I know there might be some other questions, but I, I did want to ask you this. This collective that you tour with, it goes in and out, right? You know, sometimes Cameron, for example, is here, there, and I think I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if he's here tonight. How do you manage the people who are going in and out of the band, and how do you manage the tune in every night with that? Bench. <laughs> <laughs> Manager. <laughs> no, you know, it's, um, I, um, it's, maybe it's another Aquarius thing. I'm not a big, um, I don't get worried very easily. <laughs> you know, um, I find that things always work themselves out. You know, like Cameron's right now, he's out with Stanley Clark, so he's not here with me now. Um, and I've, I'm, I've, I've always been a really active musician. So like my little Rolodex of musicians is pretty crazy. So I can usually find someone to make some music with. And I'm not, I'm not rigid. Like our, the, way we, the way I treat my live shows is that each show is a unique experience. So I'm not like trying to find some, so if Cameron Graves or Ronald Bruner or Miles Mosley, they can't make it. Um, I'm never trying to replace them because I, I don't really think I can. They're, they're all pretty irreplaceable. But what I look at is an opportunity to make a new version of a song. And like, you know, so there's a young kid I've been using a lot lately named Jamel Dean, who's like 17 and he reminds me of us when we were a lot younger. And so like, when he plays my music, it's like a whole different thing. He's like bringing, you know, you know, YouTube and Twitter to the music. <laughs> is, is, he, is he coming tonight? No, no, he's not here. Brandon Coleman's playing tonight, who's someone I grew up with and who's part of the West Coast kid now. Yeah. Any other questions? Who are the members Gi of the Young <clears throat> Jazz Giants? The Young Jazz Giants originally was um, myself, Cameron Graves, um, Thundercat, Stephen Bruner, and his brother, Ronald Bruner. And then later on into it, Ryan Porter, trombone player, started playing with us, and uh, Terrace Martin started playing with us. Yeah. Well, everyone that was in the Young Jazz Giants is in the next step of my, my, my band now. Yeah. yeah, I have two drummers. San Jose, Ronald Bruner was in there, but Ronald Bruner will be there tonight, and that's a, 
surprise in and of itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> you never know about that guy. My dad's going to come and play tonight. Your dad's playing tonight? Yeah. I've never seen him play. That's amazing. Yeah, it'd be fun, yeah. Well, that's incredible. I mean, there's, this is an off-told story, but your father and the Bruners, his father, I mean, you, they just really passed the whole thing down to you guys, didn't they? Yeah, that's how we met. Like, um, my dad and, uh, and, and Thundercat and Ronald Bruner's dad, dad had, a <clears throat> had a Christian fusion band together. <laughs> Yeah, that was like... And surprise, that's tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they had this band, and, like, you know, they were, like, playing, you know, gospel songs in 11-8 and stuff like that. And um, for my third birthday party, I got a drum set, and uh, Ronald Brunner Sr. brought his kids to my birthday party. And uh, I don't fully remember it, but the story is that Ronald Brunner Jr. and I had a little drum battle and that's how we ended up becoming friends. And that's when you became a saxophone player. <laughs> he chased me right off them drums. Because if, yeah. if you see Ronald Bruno play drums, <laughs> man, there's no point. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. When did you get the saxophone? Um, <clears throat> so I started off on drums when I was about three, and then I went to piano when I was about five, and then clarinet when I was around nine, and uh, saxophone when I was uh, 13. And you knew then that, was, that you wanted that to be not the only instrument, obviously, you do everything, but the main, your main source of voice. Yeah, no, it definitely was my voice. I mean, it was my voice even before I started playing it. Um, probably a year or two into playing clarinet, I, I really got into jazz, and uh, I, I already knew I wanted to play saxophone, but my dad was a, a sax, he's a saxophone player, and, you know, he grew up in the 70s, where if you're a saxophone player, you need to be a doubler, so, you know, you need to play saxophone, flute, and clarinet, and clarinet is the hardest of the three. So, and he just knew how much I wanted to play saxophone. And he knew, like, once I got the saxophone, I probably wouldn't be spending too much time on the clarinet. And, um, but I was listening to saxophone players. Like, everything I wanted to do was saxophone. It wasn't clarinet, you know. So when I finally got a saxophone, it was, he was right, you know. <laughs> I haven't, you know, spent enough time with clarinet ever since. I, I, do you play clarinet ever? Um, <clears throat> every once in a while someone will call me for, you know, a session or something like that and ask me to play clarinet, and I very, um, reluctantly will admit that I can play it, because <laughs> I respect the instrument, and it's such a beautiful instrument, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I do play saxophone, flute, and clarinet, but, you know, I just feel like if you want a clarinet, you should get a clarinet player that can really play it beautifully. I can do it, but, you know. I don't know how beautiful it'll be. <laughs> Any What was the recording like for the... Uh, it was, I mean, I hate to say it, but it was, it was like a sweatshop. <laughs> That's the way it was at the Rotund Rascal, too, Yeah, if I there was right. no bells and whistles. We, you know, we, we were eating on top of pianos and <laughs> drums and floor toms were, were chair, trays. And it was... Um, but it was a very creative space because it was... Um, we let, cause, because we were in there nonstop, it was kind of always running. So the studio was like... As soon as you came in, it was like ready to go. And um, it was, you know, uh, King Size Sound Labs is, there aren't a lot of bells and whistles there. It's like, there's a lot of great gear. There's a lot of cool instruments. Um, they have like, you know, like natural reverb. They have like a, a, a real plate reverb. They had like a bunch of really cool like synths, like Moogs, old Moogs, old keyboards. A really cool old B1 organ. Um, so the setup was we had um, Brandon Coleman's, so Brandon Coleman also brought his whole gauntlet of keyboards, which was like a, like <laughs> the Millennium Falcon, like you never know which one was gonna work or how long it would work. And um, so we had Brandon and the drums in the main big room, 
And then we had a, a booth for the horns, which felt like a closet. <laughs> and like, then we had a booth for Miles, that was like his bass player. And um, Thundercat was also in the same room as the, uh, the drums and the, and the organ. Cameron had his own space, like a little piano room. And um, like, when I was recording, I was usually using a lot of people. So, you know, it was kind of just like, it, it, we, set up, we, we, we set the days up so that it was more so like a round robin. So each day we do two or three different projects. Um, some days we focus on one, but most days we're kind of two or three. So the room that became like the most important kind of changed depending on who was working on their stuff, you know. But it was fun. It was, it was a really interesting experience. I mean, we um, definitely got to know each other better than we probably ever needed to know each other, you know. We kind of didn't talk for a good three, four weeks after it was over, because it was just like, I've talked to you more than I needed to talk to you ever, and, you know. Um, but there was some cool moments, like there was one, you know, um, George Duke came in to record some stuff on Ronald Bruner's record, and there was this really, really cool moog that we had in there that had some really cool sounds in it, and some really cool oscillators. But it would only work for like 15 seconds at a time. <laughs> so George Duke plays this whole crazy solo that you might hear on Ronald Bruner's record, 15 seconds at a time. And so it was like, it'd come on, it'd be like, doo, 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 and it's working like, push record. <laughs> and like, it was like, it was this really like funny thing because it was like, and when we listen back to it, it, it sounds so seamless and it was like, he was like, all right, I'm out. And it was just, you know, stuff like that would happen all the time. Like, people were coming in that you just didn't know. You never knew who was going to be coming in or what was going to be happening. So people would come in, you know, they come into one of my sessions and it'd be, you know, a whole big choir and strings. And they're like, what is going on today? Yesterday, you know, Ronald Bruner was in his booth rapping. <laughs> okay, I got a question for that. You can't just have a choir just walk in, right? That must have been planned or something, right? Well, uh, Miles Mosley is a, a very organized individual. And he would, uh, he had this big board and uh, he would, he had to schedule. So like you'd see like, okay, on Thursday from, you know, like so those days were like, we, I had the whole day. So like on Thursday, we're just doing Kamasi string and choir stuff. So you'd see it coming. And, and so the night before when we finished, we'd like clear out the drums and that's what we do, you know. So it wasn't, it wasn't that complicated in that sense. It was just, you kind of look, what are we doing tomorrow? Okay, we're doing that. So we kind of get ready for it the night before. It sounds like one of those experiences you probably could never replicate ever again. That just the, the idea of that kind of a thing. Not without like a couple of goons and like a, <laughs> a shepherd dog or something, because it's just we were we were so tight in that in that in that, in that situation. It was, we we talked about redoing it, but maybe for like two weeks at a time. <laughs> we can a week at a time, a week at a time. How do you negotiate creativity within the industry? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, I've always taken an approach of, um, uh, if I'm creating music for you, then I'm creating music for you. And I'm just trying to create what you want me to create or do what you want me to do. And that's like a, <clears throat> That's a particular part of being a musician. Um, there's, you know, I, I have integrity. I have a, like a musical integrity that like, I don't do things that I know I don't want to do. Um, but if I agree to do something for you, if you say, hey, I want you to create a horn part for this song I wrote, I'm gonna try to create the horn part that I think you would have created for yourself if you had the ability to do it. Or, you know, I'm trying to figure out what you want. I'm just trying to give you what you want if I'm making music for you. When I'm making music for myself, I, I am pretty, um, I'm not very compromising, you know. I just do exactly what I'm hearing because I feel like that's the best that I can do is like exactly what I'm hearing in my head. So the negotiation of that is more so like, 
what is this? Is it my thing or is it your thing? If it's your thing, I'm gonna do exactly what you want me to do. And I tried to, to be a little bit cautious in that, like, you know, if someone asks me to do something, I'll, you know, I'll check out the music to see, like, and sometimes people ask me to do stuff and I'm like, I'll listen to that music and I'm like, you know, like, nothing against what you're doing, but like, I don't really hear where my sensibilities are gonna work in what you're doing. So I'll ask you, I'll ask them usually before, you know, before I say yes, like, so what are you looking for me to do in this, you know? You know, and then they'll tell me, and, I, and, I, and then I'm just pretty honest about like, you know. But at the same time, that's where I'm at now. When I was younger, I was much more open to just do whatever. And, but even then, I always treat it like, you know, like, even if I don't agree with you doing it, I don't think it's what I want to do, I'll do it and learn it. And because that, I think there's, value in all types of music, you know, and, and if you really open yourself up to it, you can learn what that value is. Uh, I think sometimes musicians, especially like learned musicians can get a little um, self-righteous and they close, their, close the doors of things that could have opened them up to something, you know. So I've done, I've done some stuff that I like going in, I didn't know how much I would be into it, but then you know, it grew and I, I realized, okay, that's what this is, you know? So I'm, they're kind of, you know, like, like the business side of it, this is more like, what you should do is do something that you don't want to do so that you're not fighting with someone <laughs> to make them, to have them make you do something you don't want to do, you know? But stay open because just because you haven't done something before doesn't necessarily mean you don't want are there certain people you've played with, though, that have been inspiring to you as a player, that you did what they wanted to do and it ended up kind of like weaving its way into, uh, into what you do? Absolutely, and a lot of times going into it, I didn't necessarily understand exactly what it was. You know, like when I first started playing the studio, all the horn parts, everything they wanted us to do was super duper simple, but it seemed like we never pleased them. <laughs> And I started to realize that it wasn't so much about what we were playing, it was how we were playing it. Or like, when I was playing with Lauren Hill, like she, she had us learning a ridiculous amount of music. <laughs> and I was like, why did we have to learn all this music like this? And then later on I realized that she wanted us to have a, a vocabulary that she could pull from to create kind of as she wanted to create. I feel like this mad scientist mixed different styles of music together. So basically everyone I played with, it was like that. It was like, when I first started playing with them, I wouldn't really understand what they wanted or why they wanted it. And as I learned it, then I started to realize, oh, and then a lot of times it would then influence the way I made music for myself. So we gotta wrap this up. If there's, okay, there's one quick question in the back. You've had your hand up, throw it out. future of hip hop. We talked about the future of jazz, now the future of hip hop. Yeah. Um, I think the future of hip hop is, like all music, I think it's, it's actually right now in a very good place. Because I feel like um, music more so than it probably ever has been is kind of like in the hands of the musicians. You have such a, a, a huge um, society of musicians who make music on their own. And so, you know, in hip hop, you look at someone like Kendrick Lamar, he was making records on his own for years before people knew about him. And um, so as you get artists like that, who then come into the limelight, you know, kind of like me, like they, they have this surplus of music that they made from a very honest place. So I think hip hop, is going to become more creative. It's going to become more. Um, it's going to. It's going to gain depth in that. Um, I think the young artists that are coming out, that are that are being born now, 
they're going to come into the world into a world where they're going to get to create music without any type of influence before they get signed and then when they get signed and they start making records they'll have a a, a, a foundation musically and creatively and artistically that they forged much earlier so i think that you know a lot of times you know in the past you know before you got to be an artist someone had to allow you to be an artist and so before that you were just hoping to get a chance to go and make music i think now you're going to really get a chance i mean for i think now you're going to you're going to start seeing more and more artists who are coming in as a bit more developed a bit being, being a bit more developed so my last question to you you know we talked a lot about artists that you looked up to when you were starting up and artists that you've played with and learned from how do you feel taking on the new role of people looking up to you and learning from you? How you how you feeling the changing of the guard working for you? Yeah, it trips me out. Like people calling me Mr. Washington and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> that kid Jamel and you know his friends, they, you know, look at me and I'm like, you know, you get older and you don't realize it. Like in my eyes, I'm like, oh, we're about the same age, right? And he's like, nah. <laughs> you kind of around the same age as my dad. I'm like, no, you're not. No, I'm not. <laughs> You're older than you than I was when I met you, man. I feel old. I almost said something really mean. I'm not gonna say that. Though. I appreciate that. I appreciate. That. <laughs> I was almost like, man, that makes me feel old. But nah, <laughs> no. Nah, I mean, you know, I think age is just a number. Um, but I mean, it's it's cool for me. I mean, I think it's um, it's kind of a um, it's a responsibility, I guess. I feel like a little bit like you know that people are looking at me as like, okay, you know, as like an example of how they want to do things. And I'm like, okay, wow. I hope you don't make some of the mistakes I made, but yeah, I mean like, you can maybe do these things I thought I did well. Um, and these kids these days are like, they're really cool. They're like the, um, you know, when I was coming up, you know, we had a lot of energy. We had a lot of, um, we were fearless in a way, but I find musicians that I meet now, the young musicians, they have a lot of, um, they're very refined. So I'm interested to see what kind of music they're gonna make as they get older because it's like they already know everything. I'm like, you know, like when I was younger, we didn't, we didn't know anything, but we didn't care. <laughs> you know, they might not be quite as fearless as we were, but they have so much information and they're so, that's like they, they've heard everything, they've seen everything, you know, so it's kind of like, Wow, and like when when you start to really develop your own sound, it's gonna probably be something pretty interesting. So I'm I'm really like you know geeked to hear like what some of these young kids are gonna be doing in the next couple of years. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have. Can we have it for Kamasi Washington, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. And for those of you who have tickets, he's playing the Independent tonight. All right. Otherwise, you'll have to come back for another time around, my friend. Yeah, cool, cool.